when you're just putting in energy, you're just putting in effort, you're just putting in labor, but there's no emotional reward at the end of it, you eventually burn yourself out. That dopamine is a rejuvenating force. So you need to reach that point. Hello, and welcome back to The Everyday Stoic with myself, William Mulligan. Join me on this journey to learn how to live and become the best version of yourself using modern and ancient philosophical teachings and practices. And remember, philosophy isn't difficult or boring. It's very fun and practical, and it is the guide to the good life. Joining me today is an art mentor by the name of Adam Duff. I discovered Adam around three years ago for his YouTube channel, Lucid Pixels, where I found a video that was the cure to my procrastination, and it was the key to my productivity. This video I put down as the contributing factor to much of my success. It made me into an ultra productive person. And the way in which Adam did it was by telling stories of him smoking and gaming. And somehow this led to me becoming ultra productive because his knowledge on procrastination and productivity is amazing. And I call him a master at this topic. But through this conversation, I found out that Adam is not just a master at these topics, he's not just a master at art, but he taught me how to become myself, how to become comfortable in myself, how to align myself with my own rhythm and make life work for me. So I'm not working for life, life is working for me. I learned a lot from him. Today's episode is powered by Huel. Huel is a quick, affordable nutritiously complete food with everything that your body needs. Also, my book, The Everyday Stoic, Simple Rules for a Good Life, is now available to buy on Amazon and all good bookstores. Let's get into this talk. My philosophy for art is my philosophy for life, right? So there is there is that crossover where my message is not exclusively for artists. I have as many programmers and tattoo artists and musicians and video editors and, and stuff that, that relate because we all go through that. It's just a human experience, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think... I- I think that is it. It's the um, it's your um, I think your care maybe or your passion. And, and this is actually how I want to start. I wanted to ask you. Um, you've got these videos that are like feel really passionate and caring to help people. Um, I believe what I'm getting from it is to um express themselves and achieve their best. Um, what why do you have that desire to make these videos and help people? That's a really good question. Nobody's ever worded it like that. Yeah, like what's what's my driving force behind doing it? Um, it's personal. I think it's personal for me. It comes from a couple of different sources. I think for me, uh, I really like that question actually. For me, it's um, success or you know finding my place as an artist, as a professional, um, in many ways growing up, and this is not just exclusive to being an artist, it's something that followed me through school as well, was very often felt like an uphill battle. I wasn't the I wasn't the perfect student. I wasn't the academic student. I was somebody who has got very bored with with the school system. I was very uh I was very not rebellious necessarily, but I just, you know, I had an issue with 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 um blind authority in that sense although i like i said i wasn't a jerk or anything like that i just to me school and work in many different ways was very difficult for me and i really struggled to find my place in it uh until many years had passed i think just my my pure passion and dedication to be an artist and my passion to succeed despite the fact that it was such a challenge um got me through it and forced me into a position life forced me to figure out my own path and to find my own voice through that process. I think because I was somebody who needed to flesh out a more deep understanding of self and a more deep understanding of my, of my place in society, um, that it made the learning process, my knowledge of self and my knowledge of, um, of how to overcome these obstacles much deeper. 
things didn't come easily to me. So I really had to have an all encompassing understanding of things in order for it to make sense to me, which also allowed me in turn to help other people make sense of it for other people as well. And I think that's probably why most of my videos are very story based. Because to me, there's no such thing as just is as just spewing out facts. I don't do checklist videos. If I did checklist videos, I could I could consolidate my 45 minute art talks into seven minutes or less, right? I could do TikToks at that point. But to me, that's not where learning happens. Like learning is a life experience. Learning is is knowledge of self. It's understanding how your physiology works, how your brain works, how your psychology works, how your biology works. And all of that has to work together to find who you are. And I, I realize, I guess, because I'm speak I speak to a lot of artists and people like you who are who work in a creative field that um it resonates with a lot of people. I find that because artists tend to not think like common people, they're not they're they're, they're not they're not practical in that sense. They are by definition pursuing a very idealistic, uh, indulgent type of career path, that their mind is wired differently. So the, the st they don't follow the standard herd. They, they have to find their own way. So I advocate for that. I advocate for knowledge of self. It's what I got tattooed on my arm, right? Know thyself. So yeah, that's where I come from, I think. Do you think because at least for me, when I start to be able to express myself correctly through art, um, more importantly through writing, because I never liked writing, I, I had no interest in it. But then when I started to express myself through writing, um, and it came just before I wrote my book, I started to like really delve into myself. Um, when I could express myself through art, I found a way to express myself better through myself, if that makes sense like in social situations and I could be more open and honest about myself. And I felt like that was because of the art. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, think about it. What is art? If you think about it, well, there's image creation, there's song making, there is uh, choreography doing, <laughs> but that's just, that's just the technical aspect of that's the technical side of, of expression. But what art is in its essence is taking all of those tools and communicating something to your audience through that. So for me, I mean, one of the ways that I love that I love to communicate is visually as an illustrator. And to me, I've learned all of those technicalities. I went through that that through that hump of learning how to get comfortable with those technicalities because technically, those fundamentals, those technicalities, are learning the language. I'm learning how to speak. So at the beginning, when you're just learning how to video edit, when you're just learning how to draw the very basics, you're just, it's like taking a language course. You're picking up the vocabulary, but at a certain point, it clicks in your brain and it becomes a form of expression. So you're not just, I'm not just relaying information to you with my mouth speaking English. I, I, the, the nuances of how I express that language, where I'm coming from, what my neighborhood was growing up, the little expressions that are exclusive to my little niche on this planet, my sense of humor, the people that influence me, the comedians I listen to, the podcasts I listen to, all of this slowly builds up into this potpourri called yourself. And as an artist, once you have that fluidity of expression, once you're comfortable with the language, it becomes an extension of self. So you have to, at that point, come to grips with who you are, because if you, if you don't, if you're not expressing from a personal place, you're a craftsperson at that point, you're a designer, you're, uh, you're, you're a technician, but you're not the artist. So the fact, the very fact that you said that it's connect, that, that your form of artistic expression that you're writing is actually helping you to connect to other people, by definition is telling me that you're approaching it from the perspective of an artist. It's a personal expression. You're expressing something, right? Yeah. Right. That's good. Cause yeah, I have felt, um, a personal growth, uh, from being able to express myself artistically and it's, it's felt good. It's made me feel, um, happier, more balanced. I feel, I just feel good about myself. Uh, I guess, um, you've helped a lot of people through your teachings and uh, your lessons. Certainly for me, um, what your videos did for me was uh, massive. 
have you ever had any maybe students or anyone that stands out to you as like a not a miracle but something that really stands out where you're seeing this person came to you maybe at the lowest and then um through some sort of principles that maybe you taught them they've grown yeah um i've had many experiences like that and i mean that's one of the main reasons why with my mentorship the way i teach not my youtube channel but my private mentorship uh that i wanted to follow in the in the example of how people were tutored back in the day it's a mentorship it's a one-on-one -on -one experience and i couldn't imagine it being other any other way because we can have this conversation you can share your personal experiences with me and vice versa and um i think that's at the core of true learning is that you can uh, learning is a personal experience you ha i have to be able to understand who you are and you have to understand who i am and we have to we have to have that that rapport with each other you're not just student number 39 sitting in the back row who's at the receiving end of sound coming out of my mouth that we're actually developing a relationship between each other we get to know each other so um I find as a result of that, a lot of the a lot of the great value that comes from that exchange with my students, who I now call friends, these become my friends, right? They're not just they're not random people to me. Um, that it's the personal thing. It's the it's the emotional obstacle. It's the it's the programming that they've had growing up in their head from family members or from from institutions they've been a part of that kind of that that fashioned this belief or this false belief that has served as an obstacle oh i'm lazy oh i'm slow oh i'm i can't adapt well no maybe that's not the case at all maybe that's not the type of artist that you are people say oh i, sh I know i should be able to work faster i should be uh i should be more efficient that depends what's your frequency are you somebody who thinks slowly do you do you want to let do you want to let thoughts ruminate in your brain and slowly simmer and after a couple of hours of expressing yourself things start to come out or are you the type of person who's fast get to the point execute it these are two different personality types art is a personality type right so i approach i very often approach helping people overcome professional obstacles by helping them find their frequency first what's your speed are you a fast artist or are you a slow artist does the great it's i i like to compare it to dance i use dance as an analogy all the time because i love to dance as well and when you're on a dance floor or you're in a club or you're listening to music you can't explain why when you turn on music when you hear something certain songs for reasons you don't know turn you on right they just whew, they ignite something in your brain and you get all excited it, and it can be different music can can impact you in different ways well when you're on a dance floor when i'm listening to a song that's for instance using instruments or it's a speed that's too fast i uh, something spiritual doesn't click on in my brain and i just go okay yeah okay i'll dance politely i'll do what i've got to do but there's no passion there's no connection there's no expression that comes out but if I can get that song that has those instruments, that has that weight, that has that perfect speed, all of a sudden, everything just flicks on and I, I go into predator mode. I'm like, <gasps> I have to dance, I have to dance now. And I will dance well beyond my capacity. I will be able to express, I'll, I'll, if the song lasts 15 minutes long, I will dance until my final breath and then I'll collapse at the end of it just because I couldn't turn that feeling off. Where in the other case, I couldn't turn it on. And artists take this for granted. They think, oh, every artist needs to work in this kind of industrialized way. No, not at all. You have to find that rhythm. You have to find that tune that clicks. And as soon as it does, you flourish. And then you find the career that complements that frequency. As opposed to doing what they say in photography, you spray and pray. You just take 16,000 photographs and you hope that one of them is a hit. Or you, in the case of job, job interviews, you send out 16,000 CVs and hope somebody adheres to that, which they don't. And then you feel like crap about yourself. In that respect, I think that for so many of my students and so many of the people that I, that I, that I have this exchange with, 
that's where that real value comes in that people realize most people in that context realize that they're not they don't suck they realize that they're not lazy they realize that they they don't have this this shortcoming that's preventing them from moving forward they realize that they've been trying to fit into the wrong crowd and as soon as they find that right crowd they find their playlist they find their song they're off right and that passion drives them that moving forward from there yeah I like that. I guess a lot of it comes down to um, limiting beliefs that we hold about ourselves. Um, and, you know, like society will, will um, put us in a box. But I also think we put ourselves in a box based off of, um, of how we feel in society. Um, I was just thinking, because you were saying about your videos, how you like to storytell. And that is what I liked about your video. Um, and I wanted to ask, um, do you still not smoke? Yes. I can't even imagine smoking at this point. That's that feels to me like my distant past. Yeah. Okay. Can you explain how that? Um, I'd say uh, I don't know if you could describe it as a brush of death, but how did that um, closeness with death? How did that impact your life? It's funny you're saying that because I was just thinking about that the other day. I, I reflected on smoking for some reason. I haven't thought about it for years, and you just, you brought it up at the right time. Um, I remember at the time. Um, when I decided to quit smoking, there were many different factors that went into this feeling like now is the time I needed to do it. And much like any person with any kind of an addiction, you get told by everybody, you know, that's bad for you. And that doesn't mean anything. And then, you know, at a certain point, the cigarette companies put these big, ugly pictures on the box to let you know what cigarettes are going to do for you. pictures of rotten teeth and women with pregnant bellies and yada, anything to scare you. And it didn't mean anything. I just took those cigarettes up, put them in another box, and that was problem solved. <laughs> that doesn't stop a smoker. At what you need to do, a lesson needs to be felt. And for me, what was happening, um, what I thought was happening was that cigarettes were starting to make me feel sick. And I went through a good year and a half period of my life where I just felt, you know, that it, it, the best way I can describe it is you feel like you're nauseous you know that feeling before you know throwing up can actually feel nice once it's out of your system but it's that toxic sick feeling in your gut like uh-oh something's happening i felt that way for two years straight okay and being a smoker not knowing what else to attribute this to i thought to myself i thought to myself oh it's finally happened i'm finally starting to make myself sick i'm damaging something inside of myself so there was this I was starting to make this association between feeling sick and cigarettes, yet that didn't stop me. But at that same time, vaping started to become a thing. And I realized at that particular point, I needed to make some kind of a substitute. I needed to, you don't just want to take a cigarette away from you or take alcohol if that's your crutch or take drugs away from you if that's your crutch. You don't want to just take it away because what you're doing is you're taking you're taking a daily comfort away from yourself. A smoker regards smoking as taking time for myself. There are positives to smoking, like for instance, deep breathing, that you stop multiple times a day and you go, is good for you. They call that meditation, <laughs> right? But you're doing so sticking a carcinogen in your mouth at the same time. So that inhale, the inhale is good, but what, you, what you're inhaling is not. So um, I didn't want to take that healthy habit away from me. So instead, I decided to replace this with the early versions of vaping, basically. But I did so in a, in a way that I feel was clever. I didn't use, I never vaped with nicotine in it. So number one, I wasn't getting that, that kind of lightheaded hit that you'd get from a cigarette, right? Um, and I also didn't get ones that had particularly great flavors. I didn't want to get anything that had a strong tobacco flavor or something that had a nice strong vanilla flavor. I wanted to get something that tasted a little bit weak to my mouth, like some icky kind of fruity taste. What I was doing consciously at that point was reprogramming my brain to what the experience of smoking felt like. I wasn't inhaling that that, that taste of tobacco. I was inhaling something that was lackluster, but I was still getting the breathing. I wasn't getting the tobacco, but I was maintaining that breathing habit. But because it wasn't satisfying, 
it was it wasn't as satisfying as a cigarette my loyalty to that experience started to dwindle it started to become less and less of an enjoyable experience it became easier to discard of and i only kept that up for a couple of months or as long as i can remember it wasn't that long my girlfriend's gonna sneeze there you go <laughs> she does this once she has her sneezing fits once a day um it's gonna happen again too um that uh uh that letting it go was much easier however there's one other little secret that 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 i've it's, it's an open secret that one of my colleagues who i'd worked with at electronic arts who was the creative director a guy named ollie sykes uh from manchester i loved him to pieces he's an amazing guy he had quit smoking when i was working at ea and he said something that that always stuck with me he said cigarettes are not difficult to quit smoking's not difficult to quit if you but if you keep telling yourself that it's difficult to quit then you're predisposing yourself to this to this difficulty that you're going to face you're already creating an anxiety by by that expectation because it's not difficult at all because it's very easy to quit and sure enough it was very easy to quit and it, it kind of makes you ask it makes you ask yourself who who instilled this belief that cigarettes are harder than you know than hard drugs to quit who 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 created this rumor who created this belief well my guess is probably tobacco companies <laughs> they're trying to make you think that no 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 this is this is the hardest thing you're ever going to do in your life it wasn't at all so um i think i might have i might have trailed a little bit away from the initial question but that was essentially how i quit i had made that association with number one I associated it with being sick. In fact, it wasn't. It was the, that I had hypothyroidism and I didn't realize that. But that's I'm sure cigarettes didn't help. But that to this day, despite my awareness of the fact that I had low uh, that I had hypothyroid and I got blood tests to prove it later on, um I associate now cigarettes with feeling ill. If I think about having a cigarette, I'll start feeling sick to my stomach. Yeah, it's just, I've made it's it's psychosomatic, but uh yeah. So there you yeah, go. that's I, the su story. I suppose the association you give to something um, does have a, a huge psychological effect. Like you're saying, giving up smoking is really difficult. Um, if that's the association you hold, then it's going to be difficult. And if you think, um, you know, completing your art project is going to be super, super difficult, then you put you pour up a huge resistance right at the start, um, and it's hard to break that down. Rather than just going into something. Um, with excitement i remember you said it like compared it to a video game like a in a video game you've got the carrot dangled in front of you um you know if if that's how you go into art you've got the carrot dangled in front of you you're excited to do it um it's not a difficult thing to paint or to draw um it's just because we put so much importance and resistance on it but actually i just want to tear a bit more from your story is um when you said you find out you had had thyroid and the doctor was um, quite amazed that you're still alive, um, or they're saying you're close to death, um, what was that? What was that feeling like? How did that have a impact on your life following from that? Okay, that's a good question because when I first got diagnosed, just to give you a little exact, just to give you numbers associated with the results I got, I, I had asked them. I'd gone for a blood test. And I said, "Can you check my thyroid? Because it is in my family, and it is it is it is uh, it can be hereditary." And I got a call at like five o'clock in the morning, the following morning, from my doctor, uh, and the call was almost alarming. <laughs> the doctor said, uh, "Is this Mr. Duff?" And I said, "Yeah, uh, yeah. This is a, this is the the this is your doctor." I said, "Hi, yeah." I'm like, oh, "Oh, what did you find?" I got scared. Right, your doctor's calling you at five o'clock in the morning and sounding a little, little concerned. She goes, uh, "You need to come in. We need to put you on medicine right away." I said, what's the problem? She goes, well, your thyroid results were very concerning, she said. And I went, okay. When I saw the actual blood test, because I didn't know much about blood test results at the time. Uh, let's say if there's, I don't know the exact numbers. Let's say the range for thyroid would be, let's say, 0. 0.5 to 8. So you want to be within this middle range. If it's low, if that number is low, it means that you're, you're, it means that you're, you're, thyroid isn't producing or at least your pituitary is not producing tsh which stands for thyroid stimulating hormone and it produces more to tell your thyroid to function harder so it's kind of like a negative feedback loop if if my thyroid's under functioning then my tsh that I'm, my body's producing is is it's like it's trying to ramp up the signal to produce more thyroid so what that will what that will show up in a result is your tsh will be very high 
And if your thyroid's over-functioning, then your pituitary is going to say, no, 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 stop the brakes. And it's going to reduce TSH so that you produce less. So if your thyroid's low, it means you're hyper. It means your thyroid's over-functioning, okay? Well, a high, anything above that, let's say, rent, like that, that, that not specific number, but let's say anything above eight would be considered hyper. Your TSH is high. We need to put you on medicine. Okay. Or you're sorry, your thyroid is low. We need to put you on medicine to increase your, your thyroid production. An alarming number would be 12. 12 is like, uh oh, this guy's in bad shape. My number doesn't make sense. My number was over a hundred. Okay. So they're like, huh? And to me, when I saw that result, when I looked at that, my first thought was, she, because she's sitting there going, it's amazing you're standing here talking to me. And you've been going through this for years. I don't, I don't know how you're standing here talking to me. I didn't believe it either. So for me, there was a good year that I did not take thyroid medicine to correct it. Because I felt that there was something else causing this absolutely astronomical number. Okay. And I thought it probably had something to do with my parathyroid. It could have been something to do because that's when I started to do a lot of homework. I started to learn and master, you know, do really study thyroids at that point. And for a good year, I didn't touch medicine. And I remember going back for another, for, for another uh, appointment with my doctor around six months later. And she goes, oh, the medicine's working because I've seen your thyroid's going down. And this point, it's around 20 something, still high, still very high but it's gone down a lot. And she goes, well, it looks like the medication's working. And I said, well, that's the thing. I haven't taken medication yet. And she goes, hmm, interesting. That said, it only kind of plateaued around, let's say 15 or something. And I knew at that point I was still kind of feeling ill, but I wasn't I wasn't the way a person with hypo, hypothyroidism should feel. You should be very overweight. I should have lost up. My eyebrows should have completely gone off. I should have had dry skin. I should have been extremely tired all the time. I didn't feel any of those symptoms at all. Whatever was happening, my body was resisting that. I didn't feel great, but I didn't feel bad enough to take it just yet. Eventually I did, and now I do. And eventually that brought my system back into the norm and everything regulated after a couple of months, I was starting to feel better. Um, but uh, uh, as far as that, quote, brush with death is concerned, I've had many experiences in my life from a health perspective or from a career perspective where I was on some kind of a brink, where I was pushed to the edge. And one of my favorite expressions is true change doesn't happen until you're on the precipice. I remember hearing that quote from uh, in the movie, um, uh, the one with Keanu Reeves and John Cleese, uh, the one where he's an, uh, he's an alien. It, uh, Keanu Reeves is an alien. I always forget the name of that movie. He's an alien in there. He, he and John Cleese is this professor, and they start doing this calculation, and um, he's doing some math thing on the on the chalkboard, and Keanu Reeves walks in and looks at it. He's a complete stranger to John Cleese at that point, and he looks at it and he corrects his formula. The kind of kind of having this math off, so to speak, and John Cleese looks at it and he erases it and he fixes it, and Keanu Reeves erases it and he fixes it, and Jen, John looks at John looks at Keanu and he goes. You're not from around here, are you? Like he reckoned you, you must be an alien to have this kind of knowledge. This isn't human knowledge. And Keanu Reeves asks him, the, asks him, why shouldn't I, for everything that humanity's done to destroy this planet, why should I give me a reason to not obliterate you? And he goes, because it's not until we're on the precipice that true change happens. It's not until we're on the edge. And life has pushed me to the edge. And as soon as life pushed me to the edge with chronic pain or with hypothyroidism or with a shitty career, you can take that and say, oh, life sucks. But nobody can. What you do is if you're really forced into a corner, you must grow. You must learn. Learn about anatomy. Learn about the thyroid. Learn about your art. Learn about your psychology. And all of these true unavoidable life challenges in my life, including my thyroid, including my, including my career, including everything, brought out the best of me. They gave me resilience. They gave me wisdom. And would I trade them for, would I, would I trade them in to live a more comfortable life? Not in a million years. Not in a million years. I would relive it if I needed to. I, I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for the shittiest times of my life. So, yeah. I really like that. It's, uh, you know, it reminds me of what the Stoics say, uh, amor fate, uh, to love your fate, because, um, you know, whether, whether you believe in destiny or not, 
if life has already been handed to you in the past, once it's gone, it's been handed to you and you can't do anything to change that. And all you can do, well, you can do what you want with it, but the best thing you can do is to take these um, crap situations, these hardships, you take them as lessons and um, chances for you to grow. Uh, you know, confusion can lead to wisdom. Um, and I, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer in that is like when I'm going through hard times now, I like to think like, this is really hard, but I know once I kind of get over the hill, um, I would have grown so much from it. And, and the same with confusing situations. I think once I'm past this confusion, um, I would have learned something because I'm facing something I've never faced before. Um, I think it's about sort of like you're stepping outside the comfort zone to grow as a person. Um, and if I guess if you never faced a hardship, it's like, it's like the, the trials of Hercules. Um, Hercules would have never been uh, this this great hero if he never had the stag or the hydra or um, the the trials of Hercules. He, he would have just been an ordinary person. And uh, yeah. Um, but I'll add to that, by the way, William. I'll add one thing to this as well. Um, I'm a Souls fan. I love Dark Souls. Right. I'm actually just about to release my Elden Ring book review. I'm excited to share that. And here's the thing. We like challenge. We like hard. People complain about it, but we like it. There's a reason why the Soul series is the most popular series of all time. There's a reason why World of Warcraft used to be by far the most dominant successful game of all time. Back at the beginning, when it used to kick the crap out of people, when it was challenging to the point of absolute frustration frustration challenge is exciting it's engaging when it's fair right it can be unfair as well but challenges life is not meant to be comfortable life is people think that a comfortable life is a pleasant life no it's it's numbing a, a comfortable life just for the sake of being comfort is, is it doesn't give you any reason to learn and engage it so those challenges, those difficulties, those pains, those those curveballs that you're served through life are deep down inside. Yeah, we complain about them, but they're also fun. <laughs> it keeps you coming back when you, you know that boss keeps kicking your ass and you want to break your remote, but then I'm going to kill him. Yeah, and you go right back in again. But if it was easy, if they handed it to you, you'd put the remote down and it would be game over. You'd be you'd disconnect. Right, and life is the same way. So, yeah, I had to throw that in. That that actually reminded me of your um, analogy of the video game. You know, gamers, um, and I, I had the realization after watching your video years ago is gamers are told they're lazy, and I suppose they they have that self belief of like, yeah, I'm lazy. I just game all day. Uh, but I've known people that will dedicate weeks to a game. Um, to like a, a certain mission or something. I don't quite understand World of Warcraft, but I know there's like a, um, you can all come together uh, to defeat a certain boss that will take a lot of uh, planning, a lot of um, a lot of hard work and effort and hours. And in your video, you're saying like, this isn't lazy. This is this is hard work. This is difficult. But why is it then that people can work hard on a video game? Um, they can maybe work hard on social media um, and maybe things that aren't in sometimes pr practical or productive to their life. How come they can do that? Yet when it comes to um, the real work of their life, things that will actually fix their situation, maybe if they're in a crappy situation, why can they not work hard in that place? Mm. Well, I think that again has a lot to do with frequency, right? It has to do with that speed. And one of the things that social media and video games do, uh, in and of themselves, I don't think they're harmful. In fact, there's a lot of benefits you know, that come with video games, strategizing and hand-to-eye coordination, and and uh, you're watching storyline and artistry and animation. There's a lot of lovely things. My my art, my career is is built off of the inspiration of those types of things. But what it, the harm that it can do, and one of the things that I'm seeing more and more today, is that it's rewiring your inter internal clock. And it's what it's doing is it's forcing everybody onto the same rhythm. It's forcing everybody onto that same frequency. So, and as we progress forward, you can see how there's the dial is being turned up. It started off with 
with YouTube videos. And then YouTube was saying it needs to be 10 minutes. And then it goes to Instagram where you get these reels. And then it goes to TikToks. And TikToks are one minute, one minute, bam, 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 one minute, one minute, one minute. So you're getting these little quick dopamine hits over and over and over and over and over again. But most importantly, it's rewiring the speed at which you expect good things to hit you. And a video game does this as well. Some games like an MMO, like World of Warcraft, require you to put more time into it. One of the things I really, really appreciated about World of Warcraft compared to all the games I'd played prior to that was that it was a real-time clock. So the clock in the game was the same clock as it was in real life. So it was you, if you had... If there was any games you had been really, really, uh, really hooked on prior to World of Warcraft, you'd notice that after playing video games for around an hour or so, you were wired because everything was like, oh, you were going through this adrenaline. Well, World of Warcraft didn't do that. You could, st I was still staying calm while I was playing the game. But now, but as you move forward, video games aren't the worst culprit. I think that things like TikTok and social media are because that time clock keep, get, keeps getting compressed. Now you take that and you put that, internal clock into the hands of somebody who's an artist. There's no such thing as producing art in a minute. There's no such thing as producing art in 10 minutes. It takes me 10 minutes just to sharpen my pencil, let alone draw anything. So if you're not, if you're not giving yourself permission to take the time you need, then you're not giving yourself an opportunity to find that speed at which the good things come out, that the good moments happen, that you get that, that reward from your work. Video games and TikToks and social media, you're going, it's a it's basically a, a, a it's a shortcut straight to the reward over and over and over and over again, removing as much friction between you and the work required to get to that point. When it comes to being productive, that's the kryptonite. That's the Achilles heel. It's that you're losing touch with your internal clock. That's why for me, when it comes to working and it comes to being productive, and I've mentioned this in some overcoming uh, uh, artist block and stuff like that videos, I create number one as little friction between me and, and getting into artistry as possible. I don't, I don't get into all the fancy tech and all these different things. No, I put on a pair of headphones, I have a playlist I already love to listen to, maybe something like Vati Vidya or some live stream of an artist that I really like that kind of puts me into the Zen mode. I already have done a lot of homework on the side on what I want it is to draw. So I grab music, mood, established. Artistic reference, I know what I'm going to draw and I'm drawing and I get into it. And I, I'm not creating all of this research time, getting into the right mood friction between me and that process of actually being productive. And then when it actually comes to painting and actually comes to creating, I'm very much aware of the fact that I know that dopamine hit isn't going to hit until about an hour and a half into my painting. I've already established, blocked it in, have the values, I've done the basic tones and everything like that. And then I've kind of got everything there. I, I, as my friend Hardy Fowler, another fellow artist says, I like to front load the planning process there. So I'll a little, little bit of effort at the beginning. And once I get over that little hump, then I go into autopilot and that autopilot is, oh, it's starting to look good. I'm starting to get excited with what I'm looking at. And that I can ride that dopamine hit of that, that moment forward for weeks. I ride that wave for weeks. A lot of people say, how could you find the patience to put all that detail into your work? There's just detail because detail is where I'm having fun. I went, I got over that little, I had to recognize, okay, there's this, I have to get past this certain point in my painting to feel it. But once I do, it's effortless. I'm completely on autopilot at that point. It requires no ambition for me. In fact, I, I obsess over my painting. I'll get up at three o'clock in the morning because I'm sitting there going, oh yeah, I got to do that. And I'll sit down when everybody's sleeping and I'll turn my computer on and I'll be drawing in the dark just because I, I had to do it. So my art takes control at that point. Yeah. So, so you're saying once you've um, climbed to the top of a hill, you can just ride down that hill until you finished a piece of art. Yeah. But if you're, if you're, if you believe that you need to find that dopamine hit in one minute or 10 or 15, you're never going to get to the point where your body tells you you're on the right track. You're just, you're, you're constantly only dealing with the labor, 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 labor. So you start to make this very negative association to your artwork. You're not, there's no, there's no emotional reward. And, and, labor 
hard labor, which art is, it's very mentally demanding, hard labor without reward has a, has a definition to it. It's called burnout. When you're just putting in energy, you're just putting in effort, you're just putting in labor, but there's no emotional reward at the end of it, you eventually burn yourself out. That dopamine is a rejuvenating force. So you need to reach that point. Yeah. So, Because I think I remember in, in one of your videos, you were saying that um, you need to do it a few times. You need to go through that process a few times. Is that so you can um, get the uh, confidence or maybe the understanding that of the process like um i know once i get over the hill then this is how it feels and you can trust in the process at that point yeah absolutely you're also creating a habit at the same time uh, um so for me when i do something i, I like to live by the two-day rule i do it twice to get hooked and i don't let it go for more than one day two days you're starting to break the habit so for me it, when it comes to drawing I won't, I'll, I'll take a day off from drawing. But then on that second day, even if it's only for an hour, I have, my hand has to touch that canvas. I have to paint or digital canvas. I'm working on a, on a pen display, but I have to produce something. I don't want to allow myself to let that trail and become a thing of the past. So anything in my life that I feel I want to be a regular part of my daily routine, getting up at 5.30 and going to the gym every day, seven days a week. Maybe I'll miss a day if I'm really exhausted and I'm overworked. Yeah, okay, I'll take a day off. But but seven days a week, if I can, and I have been for most of the year, I will be at that gym at 5.30 in the morning. If I, if I break that habit for two, three days, I'm starting to let it go. Playing chess. If I like to play chess, I'll always play at least one game every few days, if possible. See, with drawing. If drawing is a part of my career, it's a part of my life, I'll always make sure I don't go more than two days without drawing so that's kind of the philosophy i use and when it comes to to getting yourself into a habit when you do it if you go to the gym once if you go and exercise once you exercised if you go twice you're starting a routine you're starting to program your brain to say hey this is i can make a life out of this i can make a livelihood out of this this can be a new part of who i am and from that point for from day two onwards you're going to start to realize it's much easier to go to the third fourth fifth You've created that pattern. Yeah. It, that reminds me of something uh, Epictetus wrote. He, he's saying, if you want to get better at um, talking, then talk. If you want to get better at walking, uh, walk. And uh, you want to do these things daily. But he also said, um, if, you, uh, if you injure your leg and then you're laying in bed for like 10 days, he says, when you get back up to walk, you, you would have realized you're, you're not so good at walking. Um, and I feel like that relates to what you're saying with like art um if you take 10 days off um maybe sometimes you do need break but if you take 10 days off you kind of knocked yourself out of that routine and suddenly there's a bit of resistance to get you back into the routine but but after that 10 days your brain said i need to walk again why because prior to that injury you were a walker Otherwise, you wouldn't even have considered it. You didn't. You didn't just say, "Oh, I have to have a, a glass of orange juice right now because I'm an orange juice drinker." That thought didn't occur to you because it wasn't a part of. It wasn't. There was no loss. It was not something that you had lost in the first place. But you were. What? This is why people who very often, you know, athletes, they get injured. They get terrible injuries. They get spine injuries and stuff like this, and they're out of commission for years. At the end of those couple of years, the first thing they want to do is start doing gymnastics again. My mother quit, technically quit art for an entire life. She, 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 she ended up becoming a mother of, of three kids, a single mother of three, and had nothing but a fine art degree and had no way to support her kids. So she went back to school, got her high school math, got a degree in computer science, had a great career in computer science, yada, yada, yada. The second she retired, she picked up her paintbrushes and she hasn't stopped painting since. The artist doesn't leave you. And the only reason she did that is because what you do today can impact every decision you make moving forward. So despite the fact that we do get our setbacks and we need to understand if I keep walking on that leg, I'm never going to heal. Once you do heal, you're already preconditioned to get back on your feet again because you've, you've already put in that work. Yeah. Is that Would you say that's... Um identity then what you believe about yourself or is it just habit i think it has a lot to do well you are what you do you are what you create right so you as my friend marlene would say she's a an, she's a, a 
a, a people whisperer. She does people coaching with horses, a very dear friend of mine. And she said, people write their own script, good or bad. People write their own script all the time and we believe it. If you keep telling yourself something or if you keep telling somebody else something, eventually people are going to start to believe it. So you can write a good script or a bad script that's entirely up to you. And you have you choose whether or not to adhere to that script as well. So yes, it becomes a part of your identity because you chose to make it so, right? Yeah. So I, I feel like then if you're... Um in in a bad place um you know th the way i like to think of it is when i was younger like when i was 18 um i was a, a laborer getting less than minimum wage and the story i told about myself was that i was uh, rubbish i was weak i was uh, anxious and i just kept telling myself these things and that led to my me taking the actions that this person that that person would take um, and the way in which I broke this cycle is by, um, one is practicing gratitude. I started looking for the good stuff in my life and that really changed my life. But then also just kind of um, rewriting the story about who I am, trying to prove that the, these things are wrong and um, switching that voice. And slowly, I mean, it, a lot of it comes down to um, me finding stoicism um, because I had something to identify with. I was no longer this this weak, scared person. Um, I was someone that was um, maybe at the time I called myself a stoic, and I, I I I was following the same principles that they did. So it always gave my life this meaning in this direction. Yeah. So you're saying that you said so many interesting things. I was like, ah, <laughs> you keep sparking my brain over and over again. But uh, you said you you were you found first of all you were talking about that script right? That you had to rewrite that script. Um, um, what I realized, especially later on in my life, it's not about rewriting the script. It's about being the one writing the script. All of these judgment calls you made for yourself, I totally relate to that. That's in fact, that's at the foundation of my art talks in the first place. My art talks are in, in great part me sharing with other people the script that I wrote for myself after after performing a, or trying to perform to the best of my capacity based off of the script that others had written, that thinking that there was a be all end all way to be. And I, I never believed that in the first place. And I never belonged into a lot of these different categories as an academic, as a student, as a professional. Um, and I believed that I was, I was a lesser I was lesser than my peers based off of not being able to fit that somebody else's script. And what you're telling me is that you took, you took the pen into your own hand. You wrote your own script. You redefined the norm according to you. This is exactly what I had to do. I spent half of my life, of my professional life, thinking I didn't have what other people had. I didn't make the cut in that studio setting. And it took me over a decade and a half for me to say, I'm not the studio type. What is the studio type? Efficient, uh, concept, uh, uh, versatile, yada, yada, yada. All of these things, okay, you can take that script and boop, 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 boop. I'm very efficient at taking those words and translating them into images. Good. That's a, that's a trade. That's a designer. I'm not a designer. I'm an artist. It's a different, it's a different frequency. It's a different DNA. And um, I took my stance saying there is a studio type and there is an, there's a non-studio type. And a non-studio type is somebody who needs to fashion their own style, needs to find their own speed, needs to find their own unique form of expression, and then go out and seek kindred spirits instead, right? And that's exactly what you're describing, that you took control of the pen. You rewrote the norm yourself and one that allows you to see the value the qualities that you that you already possess that you completely ignored because you're too focused on what other people described as quality right which is what brought you here and then you said um that i discovered stoicism right that you discovered stoicism and it's funny because it i, I have I've, i have done a little bit of studying of philosophy i started getting into philosophy last year a little bit starting with the basics right 
And I haven't yet deeply gone into, into Stoicism, although Stoicism found me. And just in listening to the Daily Stoic uh, uh, regularly, uh, especially in the last few months, so it was very ironic that you guys reached out to me when you did, it kind of those, those, those fates definitely aligned. Listening to Stoic philosophy, I very much align with Stoicism already, but I made those discoveries through my own organic way that I realized I am very much a Stoic in so many different ways, but not because I adhere myself to any book or philosophy or preaching. It's just because they align with my core beliefs as a person. These are things I had to find out the hard way through my own life. So yeah, I just find it kind of interesting that one way or another, you used you you found Stoicism and, and learned from it. I learned the hard way and realized that Stoicism was the natural organic way at which I came to terms with my own life. And then I just realized that somebody had already written that book thousands of years ago. <laughs> it's kind of neat to find that. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing I like about Stoicism is, um, you know, I've always said this, like one of the most stoic people I know, um, or someone that practices Stoicism the most was my mom. And she doesn't know what stoicism is um but like i think these are natural principles and things that humans have inside them it's kind of um i like to just call it like a, a, the guide to the good life or the guide to becoming the best version of yourself uh, in, in a society so i think you know these um principles are quite universal i think and i, I remember um when i was rewriting my story um I just, mine just came from, um, I don't know what it came from, but basically if my situation was bad and then every time I'd be at work and walking home and on the bus, I just kept saying, my situation's bad, um, I'm rubbish, I'm this. And I just kept trying to prove that these things were right. And I remember one day just thinking, um, even if these things are happening, why am I trying to cement them as a fact? Why am I trying to prove to not even to anyone, I was trying to prove it to myself that this is my life. Why don't I try um be in the same situation, accept what's happening, but try tell myself that um I'm not my circumstances, I can do better and I can grow. Um and at the time it felt really fake. It felt very uncomfortable to tell myself uh positive things. And I think this is what uh, a lot of people are going through now is uh they are just telling themselves this story and they're comparing themselves to people on social media and it it feels uncomfortable for them to like have any self-belief and uh rewrite their story in a way well familiarity is can be comfortable even if that familiarity is not healthy or it's not productive right and seldom do we stop and just read this script that we've read over and over and over again about ourselves. There's so many things that we've grown up familiar with and comfortable with hearing and have never actually stopped to say, what does that actually mean? And is it actually real? And where did it come from? There's a lot of these things we've heard growing up as children and the, the beliefs that were passed down from our parents or the behaviors from our parents. And we never, or not until much later on in our lives for most of us, if, if ever at all, do we stop and say, does that make sense to me? Yet you have repeated that same thing in your head over and over again. And you wrote it, you believed it, and you've adhered to it, even though it's not helping you. I'm an addict. I'm a smoker. No, I'm a guy who put a cigarette in his mouth 18,000 times. That doesn't make me a smoker. It's not my identity. It's what I did. Right? And same thing with you. You, you grew up and there was a lot of crap in your life that you are not particularly proud of. Well, number one, who, what basis of comparison do you have? Where are you, how are you making that judgment call for yourself that this is bad or good? And furthermore, who has put in your head that you are incapable of fixing that problem under, under natural, healthy-minded context, right? If you're somebody who's suffering from depression or from, uh, or from ADHD, these are not things you necessarily have 
uh, have chemical control over. But I'm just talking under normal terms. We we we're raised being hearing things so often that we end up believing it. We repeat things to ourselves so often that we we've created a pattern in our brain that can be easier said than done to break. But it takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of willpower to say, why did I say that? Do I need to keep saying that? Is it helpful to say that? No. Okay, then stop. See what happens. <laughs> you got nothing to lose. Because obviously saying crap to yourself for the last 10 years hasn't been very helpful. But it's it's it it's we have to t we have to untangle this incredible web of well, all this other crap, these other distractions that are going on in our life to allow us to get to that point of clarity in our own lives. It sounds like you're at it sounds to me like you're at a very exciting point in your life right now. You're you're making some pretty awesome discoveries. Yeah. Yeah, I, I certainly am, and, and it's a it's a fast fast discoveries, and, and I think that is coming from um, self belief. Uh, and rewriting my own narrative in a way um, you know for most of my life I thought I was an introvert I was shy I didn't like talking to people I didn't like talk like um, expressing myself I was very uh, didn't really express myself much uh, good or bad expression and uh, since starting podcasting starting making the videos um, I kept putting my voice in something and then I started putting my heart, heart into that same thing. And eventually, I found out that I really like doing this. Like today, I've re been really excited to talk to you. Um, making, uh, I was filming a video yesterday, really excited to film it. Whilst I'm doing it, uh, you know, it, it's like you were saying earlier, you, you're not, when I first started, it felt like I was working. Like I felt like I had to think about the words I said and had to kind of maybe write some stuff down, string it together. But now I just kind of, get up there the first five minutes might be a bit um uncomfortable or a bit um clunky and then suddenly um it's an hour hours gone by and i'm still flowing and feeling good about myself and that would have never that would never have come and that feeling i have about myself now feeling balanced and feeling good about myself would have never have come if i didn't um just reflect kind of like you're saying if i if i'd never reflected on um, the story I was telling myself never reflected on a person who I like thought I was or who I was expected to be. If I didn't reflect on this, I would have never realized that it's completely wrong. Hmm. Yeah. It's very interesting. You're saying that too. Cause I, I, I tend to be that way too. Uh, I don't generally like to use a script and I find that especially if I'm doing a podcast with somebody else, like having predetermined questions and things like that, they can be helpful. I'm not, not knocking organization, but, um, I feel talking to you right now that we're actually having a conversation. I feel that because you're not sitting there looking down at your notebook every two seconds, that that you're listening and you're you're paying attention to what I'm saying so that you can share your own experiences and reflect them back at me. Had you already made that predetermined decision, which is which is redundant, if that was a redundant phrase, if it's predetermined to you that that you're going to ask those questions. You're waiting for me to finish talking so you can ask the question. And I find this, I just find that the, the fact that I feel like you're here with me and you're asking me these questions is a very nice experience from the receiver's end that I feel like you're listening and we're having, we're getting to know each other on a personal level. So yeah, I think that's pretty cool. It's not easy to do though. Like it takes, there's going to be a lot of ums and ahs. There's going to be a lot of, a lot of, um, 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 looking for words, for lack of a better, because I'm looking for words right now. <laughs> but you get comfortable with that imperfection. And I find to me, the imperfections is what describes as people. It's not our perfections. So I, I like that. I find that refreshing. And I'm sure your audience is too, for sure. That's nice to hear. Um, going into it without questions, the first, the first minute is a bit like, oh, what what am I going to say? What am I going to ask? Uh, what what we're going to talk about? Uh, but I I did find you know at the start I was writing questions down, and it's like you'll be talking, and then I'm like oh I need to think of something to say. Let's uh, make sure I get this question. And then you finish, and suddenly I'm I'm not even reacting to what you've said. I've gone okay. So what do you think about um this? Or what do you think about this? And it's it just ruins the flow and I also believe and this is the one thing that drives me to this more 
is, um, and it's something I've been very uh, passionate about recently, is the only gift we have, and it's a great gift, is our unique self. Um, like a whole unique experience through life that's made us, our own character, who we are, the way we think. Um, and I think if I can, uh, if I can let my unique self with no barriers, no resistance, get out there and ask the questions that are really important to me. Uh, you know, like um, I'm, I was very curious about procrastination and productivity and I want to hear this from you because I feel like you're an expert on those topics. Um, I feel like my curiosity and my uh, interest into those topics, there's millions of other people out there that will have the same questions as me. They'll be thinking like me and they want to hear that same curiosity. Whereas just writing down the questions that you think people want to hear, um, it's just, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think there's much to it. So are you, like in that sense, you're you're asking me how how do I approach the subject of procrastination myself? Well, yeah. So, yeah. How, how have you um, approached, yeah, how have you got over procrastination? How have you... Um, Managed to be, you seem like a productive guy, and you seem like you get a lot of uh, art done. Um, and how have you m managed to get there? Okay, well, I appreciate the uh, master of procrastination. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll take the compliment and run with it. Uh, I'll put it to you that way, but uh, I, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that's all, always the case. I am productive very often. Um, uh, and again, that falls into finding that rhythm. It's to knowing what value I have to bring to people and offering that to people and being discovered for the things that I care about and the things that I that I'm passionate about. And then those people, a lot of those people will offer me things to say, like the fact that you and I are sitting here. The reason why you and I are sitting here having this conversation is because I made the decision to share publicly what I'm passionate about and talk about it. And you discovered me through that process. And now I'm here spending this time with you productively, helping other people grow. And it's kind of creating this branching off effect. When it comes to my personal work, I have always found that the more I dedicate myself to things I care about, the more opportunities to keep me busy and engaged happen that life itself keeps me productive. I'm not sitting there staring at a wall, trying to will myself to be productive. That I'm actually, when I, there's something I care about, when there's something interesting that I like, I pursue it. And it, I, and I, I, I try my best not to adhere to this label that I've created of myself being Adam is an artist. This is who we, Adam's a smoker. And he's an artist. No, I'm not any more an artist than I am a smoker. It's just what I love. It's one of those things that I love or don't love doing. And I and I and I pursue these passions accordingly. Now that said, I also love audio. I have a nice pair of speakers over here. I love listening to music. I also love writing. I have a nice collection of little fountain pens over there in journals. I also love training and exercising. I also love cool camera equipment and making cool cinematic book reviews. And I love nerding out with stuff like that or really good headphones. There's all these little side passions I have. And what I do, what I've learned to do is, hey, this is my world. I'm going to share that with you. This is my channel. I'm going to share it with you. And as such, that passion and all of these interconnecting things that I love start to fuse. And now I have audio companies sending me speakers and I have gaming companies sending me these things. In the material sense, I don't give a crap. What it's showing me is the fact that in order for me to grow my productivity, in order for me to offer more of myself and be engaged in more things and feel more, more like I'm contributing something to people of value, I have to first put myself out there and and show people I care for that, right? So whether a jewelry company asks me to design a ring or a tattoo artist asks me to design a tattoo or a, a speaker company asks me to review their speakers or a, a, a art accessory company decides to reach out to me has everything to do with the fact that I put myself out there first. The alternative to that would be doing my best 
to perform the duty according to what those studios want and building a portfolio that is marketable, that a director would feel safe hiring me for and do that. And, and my value, I feel, would be the greatest value I would have to offer is to help that studio hit their hit their production deadline and help that studio make money so I can go home and watch Netflix. And to me, to me and to every human being, not just myself, but to you and every other person, there is so much more to you and the value that you have to bring this world than doing this podcast with me. This is just one thing you're passionate about, right? And it's your excuse to connect with people. But there's so much more. And your audience, your the, your people around you want to know that. And as you become this more versatile, more flexible, more open-minded, more versed, more wise person, just because you bring, you just become this this sponge. You know how your mind works. The, the law of attraction starts to work for you, and you just start to attract all these different things. That that there you be, develop this feedback loop with your life that you give and it, you receive, and you give and you receive, and there's this constant fluidity with the world around you. And I'm finding myself right now at this point in my life in that sweet spot that you go back 10 years ago, you would be speaking to a completely different human being, a person who wanted to get that job, who wanted to, you know, impress that boss. And that was it. And when that boss didn't like me, and when that boss did sack me, that my self-worth was directly connected to that person's verdict. Not anymore. Now I look at those jobs that, and I think to myself, Thank God. Thank God I wasn't there, right? Allah, I find more people more people nowadays need to discover that. Yep. A quick word for our sponsor, Huel. Huel is a quick, affordable, nutritiously complete food with everything that your body needs. I love Huel and I've been using Huel every day. It is what powers this podcast. It powers my everyday and it powered me with writing my book, The Everyday Stoic, Simple Rules for a Good Life. And recently, I've took a very great liking to their new product, Daily Greens, which is delicious, quick, and easy. When you shake it up, there's no lumps. It's tasty. And I, just before leaving the house, I'll quickly make it in less than a minute. I'm at the house, and I'm feeling good about myself. I know that I've got all the nutrition that my body needs, and... I enjoy it, I like it, it's delicious. And a quick word about my book, The Everyday Stoic, Simple Rules for a Good Life. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone that is sending me messages, everyone that's buying the book um, and giving reviews. Uh, if you enjoyed the book and it's helped you, then leave a review on Amazon so other people can see that it's helpful. But I've had some great reviews. I've had some um, emotional messages that have really touched my heart and uh, it makes me feel good. Um, it just makes me feel inspired to do more writing and try help more people. So the book is available on Amazon and all good bookstores in the UK and it's coming soon to the US and Canada um, but it's still available for pre-order and it's also coming to 12 different regions, um, can't think of them off the top of my head, uh, Greece, Spain, um, Serbia, um, the, I'll put the list in the description because I can't remember off the top of my head but let's get back to the talk with Adam. Yeah, I mean, the position you're in sounds amazing. I feel like I'm sort of, um, I'm starting to feel like that. Um, what What is the process or what was your process to actually getting out of the, you know, you talk about working for someone and that was your kind of identity, that was your maybe your uh, dream or your goal, at least what you thought might have been your dream or your goal. Uh, what was the process of kind of stepping out of that lane and getting into your own um, space, what you're in now? It, it ties right back to what I said before. True change doesn't happen until you're standing on the precipice. And the precipice for me at that point in my life was a 10 plus year career where I kept trying and failing and trying and failing. Remake my portfolio, uh, rebrand myself, be better, work harder, uh, overcome my own self-doubt. Just, you know, yes, I know, but blah, blah, blah. You can't walk around with your tail between your legs. Keep pushing. You've got somewhere you want to get. Keep going. And I reached a breaking point 
And I remember turning to my partner. I turned to my girlfriend and I said, I said, Jen, I can't start over again. I was just so completely, utterly burned out to the, the thought of spending another eight months starting all over again, trying to attract the attention of somebody who doesn't even know I exist, some studio, some whatever. And I made that decision at that point. The most important decision of my life and my career was, as Jim Carrey says, you can feel it what you don't love. So you might as well take a chance at what you do. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be selfish. I'm going to do the kind of art that I love. Screw what this studio wants. Screw what that studio wants. I've completely lost my sense of self. I've completely, I've completely forfeit my integrity just for the sake of trying to appeal to somebody whose job I only partially want at best. I'm going to do the kind of art that I want. And all of a sudden, something clicked into place. I all of a sudden started to really enjoy and grow artistically. I started to become consistent. I started to feel that I wasn't just hitting that reset button all the time. All of a sudden, I felt like every piece of art that I produced was a building on top of an already existing foundation. And I started to expand and expand and expand. And then tying into what I said earlier, I wasn't just adhering myself to art. A-R-T. I was it here. I was going, ooh, jewelry did that. Ooh, tattoo. Ooh, astrophysics. Ooh, this. Ooh, philosophy. All of these different things are starting to tie in. Right now, I'm starting to delve a little bit more into architecture. I'm finding that as a fascinating topic. Writing, photography, lighting, sound, all of these. I teach these things to my art students. And I, may, I bridge these connections between color harmony and sound waves. Right? There's a direct connection to that, but they're just different. They're just different properties of waves. But who would, how would I ever even come up with this stuff if I was still trying to draw that stupid port, to build that portfolio for that stupid company that I don't even want to work for, right? And that was the tipping point in my life when I decided to have faith in myself, have faith in the things that I love. And what happened was instead of me trying to solicit myself. Standing on that street corner going, hey, studio, want a good time, right? Instead of being the guy on that corner with my sexy uh, sexy uh, uh, nylons on, if you can picture that, don't, it's traumatizing. <laughs> but instead of doing that, I'm instead here with this great, great identity that I'm starting to create and people start to discover me. I start to become discovered. People start reaching out to me. And say, wow, I love your style. Oh, I like what you do. Can you do this for us? At that point... Um, that I made that change. Instead of trying to appease the studio gods, I decided to appease myself and become the best version of myself artistically. I put all of that energy towards myself that I became discovered for the first time in my life. People went, oh, Adam, oh, who's this? Because now I had a voice. I wasn't, I wasn't forfeiting my voice to everybody who needed it. I was built, I was using that energy towards building myself. And people discovered me. I wasn't, I wasn't reaching out and hoping people would would be attracted to me. I instead just was myself, and people who liked what I did found me. It was a total change of mindset, and it was a, that was that's what set off the domino. From there, being somebody who had already had experience as a teacher, I decided to start a mentorship. I, I, it, there was this little thing that happened in my head was. Whereas where I realized frustration is the best tool for discovery and innovation because I was frustrated about my career. So create one. I was frustrated about the state of the school system that I was, the, the public school system. So I created one, <laughs> right? I was frustrated with how, I, I remember when starting my YouTube channel, it's the same thing. I was, I was frustrated that I was trying to play the YouTube game. And I was failing at it because there's too many goddamn people on YouTube. So stop and do it your way. The minute, I swear to God, William, the minute I decided to say, I am sick and tired of producing videos that are that that YouTube's trying to trying to encourage me to be a distraction. No, who do I listen to when I'm painting? I listen to calming, long form videos that get me into a mood. My number one soundtrack, my, my number one playlist is Vati Vidya. I watch Vid Vati Vidya all the time. Why? The sound of his voice, the mood of what he's talking about, the music, the lore, everything just kind of pulls me into this, 
the zone. That's the kind of video I want to produce. I am producing a video for artists. My The artists are the ones I care about, not YouTube. Screw YouTube. I don't care about YouTube. I'm doing this for myself. I'm doing this for my audience. And the minute I did, my audience found me. They found Adam. They didn't find the YouTuber artist. They found me. So my video is all, my my every decision that I make is not based off of what I think people want. My videos are based off of who I am and who I can connect with on an authentic level. That's why I do product reviews for things that don't even have anything to do with art because they bring they bring joy into my life and I want to share my joy. Period. That's it. The only companies, the only products that I that I will do through a feeling of obligation are art related to technology because I'm an authority on that subject. This is my career. So in that particular case, I'll review things blindly. Otherwise, no, anything that I put my heart to has to be something I'm connected to and opportunities, artistic opportunities land on my lap from completely unexpected places like designing a ring for clocks and colors, you know, whoever thought I would have done something like that, but I did. And it was an awesome job. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you try fit into a box, you'll never flourish. Uh, and it sounds like, you know, um, like what I was saying earlier is um, your unique self, your unique passion. Um, I, I think that is your um, greatest gift because um, it's kind of all you've got against everyone else. That's the only thing you have that they don't. Um, and when you can really bend into it, really accept it, uh, not allow, like you say, you're not allowing YouTube to... Um, tell you what to do you're not allowing um, what you think will do well to tell you what to do you're just following your passion and what you're wanting to do and I think um, so many people resonate with that and that's why your videos do well because the um, people want that and, and don't forget too trends come and go trends come and go right now YouTube wants you to do it this way now TikTok wants you to do it this way so what happens Everybody changes and tries to, oh, okay, that's what people want. So they all change and try to chase after that algorithm, chase after those instructions. And I'm old enough to know in my life, like for instance, with AI, our artificial intelligence art and all that kind of stuff that a lot of art, have a lot of artists up in arms right now for understandable reasons. Older artists like myself aren't particularly panicked about AI. We've seen trends like this come and go. And we I've learned from experience and from time that those trends, whoop, they derail, but then it always comes right back around and it comes right back on the track again. Humanity remains humanity, whether they like it or not. So whatever it is that you do, if you stay on that, on that faithful path of self, then life find, keeps refining you all the time. It keeps refining you. And every single time that it refines you, you're a better version of yourself because you never lost, you never felt, fell off kilter. You're always a consistent, you're always consistent in that sense. And, and that's something that's very respected professionally. The thing that I learned through time, through artificial intelligence, through the emergence of 3D that kind of destroyed the traditional animation industry at the time. And all of these other trends, YouTubers that are producing YouTube videos are people who are trying to make a name for themselves on social media. And social media is a moving target. It's constantly a moving target. Platforms change, algorithms change. And to me, it's always been crucially important to remain yourself through that, to keep a consistent path through that, because that that's the only way to grow in the best way. And I've noticed that trends would leave. People kind of get derailed from these trends. They break away because of these trends. They quit because of these trends. And every, everything changes. Some people stay on the narrow path. It doesn't necessarily move as fast, but then eventually... That trend finds you again. And I've I've I have experienced having the rails removed from under me, but I kept going in a straight line. The line that felt right to me. And eventually those tracks popped up underneath my feet again. And I gained that inertia. And when I did, I also had integrity. I had a greater sense of faith in the decisions that I'd made, that I didn't get seduced by doubt. And I allowed myself to say no. Give it time. Things will come around. Be true to yourself. You can't change who you are. Just keep being yourself. And that's why this is one of the millions of reasons why I wrote Know Thyself on My Body.
because it's the greatest lesson in my life that has continued to serve me in every different facet of my life time and time and time and time again yeah know thyself can you just explain why that means something to you because you for starters the greater sense of self that you have the less for starters you compare yourself to others i'll give you i'll give you an example you're walking down the street this is i'm telling you this has happened in real life okay this is some of the real life experience walking down the street and a complete stranger some little weird looking woman walks by me she's around i'm six three and she she was like maybe two foot two you know she's about knee height and i walk as i'm walking by her a complete stranger on a sunny day right on the corner of the street i look down at her and she goes and keeps walking she gives me kind of like this kind of look a hundred percent of us are going to go what is it? What did, what did I do? Right? And then you walk as you're walking down the street, you're still you're still thinking about that look she gave you. And you're starting to judge yourself. And then you realize there's nothing wrong with me. And then you get all of it. Why did she do that? Why why did she get that's rude? What what an asshole. And you start getting all pissed off at her. She's already long gone. She's gotten on a bus and she's in she's in Pavangatuck at that point. She's nowhere near you, but you're still ruminating over that look you got from her. The word to me, know thyself is. If there's something right or wrong about me, I'm fine with that. I am who I am. I have to ask myself the question, did I do anything knowingly to hurt or embarrass somebody else or myself? And answer that question for yourself. No, I didn't. Do I look stupid? Yes. Tell me how. Is it something that I have a personal problem with? No. Well, then that's irrelevant to me. If I'm... If I'm at a gas station and somebody yells at me, maybe I'm backing up and somebody goes, why don't you mind your own effing business? Well, why don't you effing driving? That guy just attacked me. He's, he's attacking my ego. He's a guy trying to dominate me, says the ego, right? So what do I do? I defend my ego. Screw you. Yeah, screw you. <laughs> you get into a street fight. No. Instead, you have to ask, you have to stop yourself and ask yourself, how do I want to handle this situation? What do, do I like conflict? No, I suck at it. And do I want to fight? No, I suck at it. I get anxiety attacks. I feel sick to my stomach. I get flustered. I get red in the face. I get all puffy in my brain. I don't know what the hell's going on. If you don't know yourself, you're getting caught up in other people's energy. You're getting caught up in other people's demands. You're getting caught up in other people's scripts. He yells at me. He calls me a name. I reach my wind. I reach outside my window and I go, are you okay? I'm sorry if I if I scared you with my car and I wasn't looking. I apologize. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to do that. If there's anything wrong with your car, let me know and and we'll we'll fix it. Fine. Okay. Have a good day. You too. I just took control of that situation by not engaging somebody else's energy. I lived. I I addressed that issue according to what I feel is right for my energy, what's right for my frequency, and I'm not getting caught up in other people's ego battles. That's their business. I'm going to address you the way it feels right to me. And the same thing trickles into everything that I do. I, I pay attention to that. Yeah. You know, that that reminds me of a story. My friend, um, he's, uh, well, he was, like, a, like the way I describe him, a really tall guy um, is like, you know, everywhere he goes, the sunshine goes with him. He's uh, really just, he does his own thing. Uh, and when, when I say he does his own thing, he does very strange, wonderful things. He'll go for a hike uh, up a snowy, snowy mountain at three in the morning, uh, listening to a Harry Potter audio book, you know, just doing his own thing. Love, just loving life. Awesome guy. And I think recently he um, lost himself. So he, he didn't know know himself um because he he was on social media more and he is uh, comparing himself to people so he started doing what other people were doing you know going out partying um wearing cool clothes this kind of thing which there's nothing wrong with that but it's um he lost himself to fit in and um recently he's got this uh, the sunshine's back with him he's, he's he's got this spring in his step and he's back to doing these wonderful things and he's happy and it was because 
he just deleted social media, stopped comparing himself to these people, and he found himself again. Um, I feel like that relates to the quote, know thyself, because because he didn't know himself, he lost himself to the noise and comparison. Um, you know, they say comparison is the fee for joy. He became just another person fitting in a box. Um, but when he found himself again, uh, he's, it, it's great to see. I can, I can visually see that he is himself. It's like he got his spirit back. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, it's, and I, I, you couldn't use a, a, you couldn't possibly have used a better example that social media, social media in and of itself is not evil. Social media is social media. It's a, it's a tool. It's, it's, it has a purpose in life and you have yours. But what it robbed him of was his, again, I keep coming back to this frequency, his speed. He, he lost, he was, it's it's like mental programming. It's like brainwashing. If you're part of some some cult, some some fanatical organization, they never let you think. They never let you think. They keep talking. I'm going to keep talking. I don't care. It doesn't matter if I'm saying anything that makes sense. I'm just going to keep making sound. Are you listening? I'm just making sound, William. You got to pay attention to what I'm saying. Okay, you listening? This is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to keep talking. What I'm not permitting you to do is say, hey, Adam, shut up for a second. Let me take control of my own thoughts again. I want to, you need to give yourself permission. Take the time you need to have your own thoughts. One of my favorite quotes is from Harry Connick Jr., a, a lyric in one of his songs. I ain't got time to hurry, so I'll take my time. Right? I love that quote. You have to own your own time. You have to reserve your right to think. And that's what social media tries, especially with the faster and faster paced social media. It's What it's trying to do is hijack your internal dialogue. It's trying to hijack your frequency so that it doesn't give you permission to think. It's a form of brainwashing. The cult, anybody who runs a cult knows that's exactly the technique. You never let people sleep. You never let people think. You keep making sure that your words are the things that are being driven into their head. The minute you stop, right now you're taking control of your own thoughts. Now you're seeing me with your own eyes. You're not listening. Now you're observing. See? So... That's what he did by by he the act of abandoning social media or or taking a detox from it allowed him to recalibrate himself. And as soon as he recalibrated himself, he found himself. And you found him. You saw that in his eyes, didn't you? Yeah. You know, um, I I always say this, and it kind of relates to what you're saying. Is I always say one of the best pieces of advice I think is it's okay to be bored. In fact, boredom's boredom's pretty cool, um, because you know people are so scared of boredom. You know, I, I always think you like I said people are telling you telling you this, and you're hearing all the noise noise all day. But then you're also maybe asking yourself questions about that, like who do I want to be? What do I want to do? Um, what's my passion? Um, who am I? And then you get home and you finally get some freedom from the noise. And instead of giving yourself the space to answer these questions and to really digest what people have said throughout the day, um, you just pull out a phone and hear more voices and you never answer the questions that you've been asking yourself your whole life. Um, but in boredom, when you sit there bored, you suddenly start to go, hmm, maybe I want to do this. Maybe what he said is not true. As I find a lot of power in boredom. Well, what is boredom? Boredom is emotional pain. It's pain. Boredom's painful, particularly if you have ADHD. It's particularly painful if you've got ADHD, right? My son's got ADHD, and well, he's got video games right at his right at right at his, he's got an iPad. He can play Roblox. He can play any video game he wants. It's right there. Same thing with social media. He can watch those any Mr. Beast video. It's it's a dopamine crack house for God's sakes, right? I hate Mr. Beast. No, no offense, Mr. Beast, if you're listening, but I hate your content. But uh, <laughs> Uh, take that as you will. But um, uh, every now and then I'll say, no, 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 let's take the iPad away. Let's take this away. Well, what do you, what are we going to replace it with? I don't know yet. Just take it away. Take away the distraction. Take away the easy route. And well, in his particular case, especially boredom kicks in instantly. For every one of us, boredom kicks in instantly. And boredom's painful. Boredom is that boss that keeps biting, that keeps kicking your ass. Boredom is that painting that you can't get going, and it stays there. And if you don't, if you don't grab the 
if you don't grab the stimulating thing, the thing that can soothe the pain, then you are forced, you are on the brink and you are forced to start being creative. You're forced to start looking for something to be interested in. And I guarantee you, if you take a cell phone, if you take an iPad away from a kid, at the beginning, they're going to have a complete meltdown and they're going to be pissed off and they're going to call you names and they're going to walk around and pace around the house and be all com completely flustered. But wait an hour. And you wait an hour and all of a sudden you're going to go, is somebody playing the trumpet? What is that? <laughs> it's a, and then or your son will show up and he'll show you a drawing because he just had to do something. But now he's doing something according to him. He's You immediately start to recalibrate and refine yourself and all of a sudden, oh, look at that. All of these geniuses that we we call geniuses, no, they were just bored, and that was the best. That was the best fix for them emotionally, and they did it so much to fight boredom that they became masters at what they did. See, so boredom boredom is painful, but like I said, painful pain's not a bad thing. Pain's a teacher. It's the best teacher. And that's awesome. Um, you've spoke a lot about frequency, uh, and it seems like it, it's kind of like the um, it's very important. Can you just explain? Can you explain it for um, you know uh, someone that doesn't understand what you mean by frequency? Uh, but how 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 would you go about finding your frequency, and why is that important? Well, you have to be very self-aware. You have to feel yourself. You have to be sensitive to your likes and dislikes. And again, this is somewhere something where know thyself becomes extremely important. If you're giving yourself permission to test your the waters for yourself. You have, your body is designed to like and dislike the things it naturally is. If you put on a certain song, like I said before, certain songs, it fires your brain off. You get excited. You're like, oh my God, you get this rush from listening to it or looking at a work of art or, or anything or putting some kind of a food in your mouth. You're, I, I can give a mushroom to one kid and they'll gag and throw it up. I'll give a mushroom to another kid and they'll eat it like it's chocolates, right? So you have to be you have to be willing to answer these individual questions for yourself. Do uh, am I the type of artist if we're getting into the context of art? Am I the type of artist that loves loves I get that real rush from that initial 15 minutes of just jotting down an idea, maybe fiddling with it and polishing it a little bit, getting to a point where I'm satisfied with it. I don't care at all if it's something super, super rendered and polished and detailed. That doesn't bring me any joy. I just love that initial 15 minutes of like nailing an idea, 30 minutes, nailing an idea. And then I get bored. Then it just doesn't do anything for me anymore. So what do I do? I push it aside. And then I go on the next one and the next one and the next one. So my artwork are these little bursts of inspiration. That's a personality type. They call that a concept artist. A lot of people don't really, my, a lot of people come to me and say, oh, I want to be a concept artist. And I say, what's your personality like? I, if I'm talking to a, con if somebody says they want to be a concept artist and ask them why, and they go, hmm, I think I'd like to be a concept artist. Um, that's a good question, Adam. Let me think about that. While they're doing that and sitting there thinking about it, I'm looking at them going, you're not a concept artist. <laughs> a concept artist would have gone, oh, I just like to make ideas and get on with it because I get bored really easily. That's how a concept artist would answer that. Bang, bursts of energy. You're an illustrator. You're, you, I, that took you 10 seconds just to breathe in, to inhale, to, to trigger your brain, to start pondering why. That's somebody who's a slow burning thought process. You have to engage that. You have to be self-aware. You have to go, okay, I know that my brain clicks on at a certain speed, at a certain time. Other artists say, oh, I don't know. I lose, I lose track of how much I'm painting something. I, two weeks pass, I don't even know. I don't, I'm not even paying attention. Oh, well, then you're probably an illustrator, right? You're probably an illustrator. So you're, that speed of thought, that speed of life, is something that you have to be very, very well at. Everybody's designed to be at a different frequency. And that's what I mean by frequency. I'm talking about speed. I'm talking about tempo. I'm talking about the th being self-aware of the things that you like, the things you don't, and not questioning them. You can spend the rest of your life. I mean, you said before, you said, um, 
you 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 saw yourself as being more of an introvert, right? And then you started to get into podcasting and you practiced that social muscle, that that speaking muscle. There could have reached the point in all of this podcasting mumbo jumbo where you go, you know what? It was fun for time, but it's kind of burning me out. I'm kind of feeling like, oh, there's just too much of this. And I really need to retreat back to my space and do something a little bit quiet. I'm not, I don't know if this is really my thing. If you're not self-aware, you would regard that inner dialogue as a failure. I tried, but I just suck. No, you try because you're somebody who's, who has to learn with his body. You have to learn by doing. You have to feel what it was like to do these podcasts, what it feels like to have these conversations. If it's something that you feel is rewarding and engaging and keeps you going, and you can just keep doing it over and over again, then you have just made a new discovery through the experience of living. But if it doesn't, there's no shame in saying, nope, I tried it. It didn't work. I'm going to do this instead. And you redirect yourself according to what feels right to your frequency, to your tastes. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, you've really shed light on that and explained it well. Um, I'll just uh, finish up with two questions because um, this camera's got a two hour limit. So it'll, it'll cut out not soon. But anyway, um, one thing I'd, I, it's two, two questions that I just like to ask. Um, so I did have pl questions planned. So I'm sorry, I lied. Um, <laughs> But the uh, first one is, um, I see philosophy as just your way of living, the, w the way you, you start to understand the world, how you navigate the world, and these little principles and mantras that you hold uh, dear to you that help you flourish and be the best version of you and fit into society. Um, how would you describe your personal philosophy? Hmm. Or the philosophy that you follow? I feel that we need to take ownership of the things that we believe in. I think that the greatest quality that anybody, the best value and the best quality that anybody has to offer others is that which we feel the most genuinely, that we feel is right to us. I'll give you an example. One of my biggest inspirations, Hidetaka Miyazaki, the creator of the Soul series, who I quote all the time, uh, from the from the company from Software. I'm reading his. I'm reading again a book that I absolutely love. It's called You Died. It's by Jason Killingsworth and Kevin McDonald. And in it, I'm actually reading the chapter again about Miyazaki. Miyazaki is a very very good example, like so many other creators out there, like some of the other individuals out there that are very, very aware of what is demanded of them, but know that in order for them to be the best versions of themselves, they have to stay true to the process that feels the most authentic to who they are. They have to know who they are. And as a result, he has, he has achieved a trust in others that when Miyazaki sits down to do something, he produces nothing but the best quality possible. That that souls would not exist without, without him because of his philosophy, because of the quality and time that he needs to create these worlds that are unimaginably dense with lore and design. He's got a hands-on, despite the fact that he's the now the president of From Software, he still has that hands-on approach where he works with the designers and the artists hands-on to make these finite little decisions on the length of a coat of armor or a, or, a, or, a, or a character's moving hold animation type of idea. He he didn't allow any, he didn't allow the demands of the outside world to cloud what he felt was right. And to me, this is exactly, it's the same thing that applies to me. I have been so bombarded with the noise of demand throughout my entire life. And I have done my best to respect that. But I was only working at a fraction of my capacity as a result. So my philosophy for life is know thyself. Plain and simple. I think that's the most important lesson I've ever learned. Yeah. I really like that. And you know, I've heard, obviously I've heard that quote um, countless times, but I've never given it much thought. I've never really put much weight to it until what you're saying um, it's really important and you know it's something that i could imagine getting myself a tattoo of it because it is very profound 
and it relates to everything. Um, the final question is, it's, it's a bit of a strange uh, question, but I think it will make sense. It's made sense to everyone I've asked. Um, I feel like everyone has a little, um, maybe a thing that they develop in their life, uh, like a principle or a, uh, a practice or something that's helped them through life, uh, the, a difficult time, um, that's maybe only, and I guess talking about yourself, it, maybe you... It might have helped you through life or impacted you in a huge way, but you you think that it's so niche and unique to you um, and maybe obscure that you've never really shared it with someone because you think you know um, it can't really help anyone else, but it's helped you. Do you have something like that that's, um, that you've acquired in your life and maybe it's helped you through life that is so unique to you and it's something that you, you've maybe just sprung into your mind one day and it's helped you? Uh, there's two, there's two answers to that. Uh, one, which is, I think that a lot of, I think a lot of the private struggles that I've been through, a lot of the, the, the difficulties that I've faced in my life, um, are not, there's, there are difficulties I've faced in my life that I want to share, but I'm not ready to share yet because, well, they implicate other people. Right. And I don't want to throw anybody else under the bus, a bus, uh, for the sake of entertainment. That's not my goal. So I've, had experiences with people, serious, heavy experiences in my life that were very challenging to overcome, that where I feel have really helped me to become the adaptable and resilient person that I am. It, 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 they helped me to become the empathetic person. They helped me to become a little bit wiser to life in that regard. But it, those are the things that that involve other people that I'm that I don't think would be fair to them to share just yet. But I do have an intention to. However, I am very much an open book in every which when it comes to my own personal life, I'm very much an open book. And one of the philosophies that I've always kept in the back of my head, and I don't know if I've ever shared this, is I've always imagined, I've always visualized being in my casket, being dead. I always imagined being a dead body in a box sitting there with, I don't know, with an onk or something, like some Egyptian burial. I don't know. <laughs> I'm being silly. You know, but I just imagine being dead, and I'm imagining what other people have to say about me on my deathbed. You know, I've been to funerals before. Oh, he was so sweet. He really loved his kids. He was such a good dad. You know, I'm sitting there going, fuck off. Really? An entire life of a human being summarized into, he was a good guy. Like, yuck. There's so much more value to a human soul than just a couple of stupid, shallow compliments on a deathbed. Um, and I thought to myself, no, I don't want people to have shallow shit to say about me. And in order to really be of value to other people, in order for my life to have value, I need to live my life with the understanding that when I die, which I will, I want that death to be of value to other people. I want the life that I've lived on this planet to be of value to other people. I know that there's a Stoic quote, and I'm probably misquoting that, Memento Mori, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, you will yep. die eventually. I love that quote because I heard it years ago, because to me, it helps you to put into perspective the things that actually true, truly do have value. And to me, the value has always been the value I bring others. I can be the, who gives a shit if I'm the richest guy in the world? I'm going to die. What's the money's going to be incinerated? Who, who gives a crap if I, what kind of, you know, material belongings I have or whatever, you know, superficial accomplishment I have? It's not going to matter. That's not, people aren't going to remember that. It's not going to leave an impact. It's not going to leave a, a it's not going to have a trickle down effect through the ages. So for me, Whatever I do contribute, every time I sit down to do an art talk or we have these conversations, I'm always thinking to myself, I want you to walk away feeling like, like there's something positive, there's something empowering, there's something of value to look forward to. I want you to have a greater sense of appreciation for who you are after talking to me. And to me, that that's something that matters. To me it's not how you i don't give a crap how you think about me i want you I, I give a crap about how you're going to think about yourself after you're done talking to me if that makes any sense but yeah yeah it makes a lot of sense 
Um, and yeah, you're right about uh, Memento Mori. Uh, it roughly translates to like, remember death or remember you are mortal. And okay. it, it's something I say to myself all the time. So like right now it's in the back of my mind as I'm talking to you. Um, and you, you've chose quite an interesting perspective that I've never really thought about. But um, right now as I'm speaking to you, um, and people think it's morbid, I like to remind myself like I could get up and drop dead just over there um just after our talk yeah i i, I yeah it, it would so because this video would never get posted um or m- maybe maybe someone else would post it but um yeah but the, the it'd thought be, is it'd be very viral too, I <laughs> guy dies on street yeah. but the idea the idea is like um if this is my last moment um i want it to be something special i want it to be amazing um i want i want to truly be here talking to you because the alternative is I just um, half ass um, the moment, and that's what you do for life. Life is made up of the moment. So if you half ass the moment you're in, you're going to half ass your whole uh, future ahead of you. Um, and I, that's the way I love to think of things. It's like when I'm on the bus, I keep reminding myself of this, and it makes me just go, "This moment is beautiful." I, I wrote a, a little like poem the other day about this, um, where because I was on the bus and I thought. Um, you know, I used to say to myself, um, life is crap, life is rubbish, I'm on this bus, um, going to work, I hate it. And then I started saying, I'm on this bus, um, I can see there was, there was an old couple, um, I, I don't know, maybe 80, and the, the woman is falling asleep on the man's shoulder, I thought it was beautiful. And then there's uh, a daughter talking to her mom, uh, talking about dinosaurs, and I thought, wow, this is it's just so uh, funny. It's a, I, I get to experience these things, I can see the sun outside, the magpies flying by, um, it is pretty amazing of an experience, and uh, because I remind myself that this moment, the moment as to talking right now, is so unique because it will never happen again, and I could die. I want to experience it to the fullest and be there fully. But what you were saying, and it has made me think, is um, lying there, hearing the words of people. Um, yeah, it would be a shame if you could listen to your funeral and they say, "Oh, he, he was uh, really, really good." He, or he was. He was funny or, or something because I'm like, is that all, is that all I am? I, maybe in a way you want to be um, indescribable because you're just this feeling that you left with people and, and you made them feel good about themselves. Um, so I, I like that way of thinking about it because it also has an impact on what you're doing right now, I suppose. Um, if, if you're thinking how, how I will feel, then uh, you're going to um, be a better person in this moment. Not only that, but you know, just just to to kind of put a cap on that particular thought is, I think the greatest compliment to my life, on my in during my funeral when I'm eavesdropping on what people are saying about me, I think the greatest compliment would be for people to say, "I'm very sad he's gone, but I'm gonna be okay." And I think that I think that that's the greatest compliment because what that means is whatever you offered them was also, you also offered them self-reliance. You offered them confidence in self. You offered them, uh, um, you offered them what comfort and what wisdom you could, but now they're completely independent of you. And it's sad that he's gone, but I still have me. And that's something that I might've helped them to realize in themselves. That they're not, oh shit, he's gone now. Everything's gonna fall apart and society's gonna end. That would be a that would mean that I took everything with me to the grave, which is a total waste, right? Yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. I love that. Um that's a good way to wrap up the talk. I hope you enjoyed today's talk on the Everyday Stoke podcast with myself, William Mulligan, and Adam Duff. I really enjoyed today's talk. I learned a lot. Um I was very happy to talk with Adam because I found his video three three years ago, maybe. It felt like longer, um, but I watched it almost every night. It really helped me and to be able to talk to him and shed light on his character, his teachings. Um, I learned so much more. I didn't think I could learn more than his videos. Um, I just kind of thought, you know, people have their viral concept. Um, and that's all they teach about you know some people just have that one thing they teach about but it turns out he knows so much more about so much different things he's very wise very balanced person i think he's a great role model and after the podcast he sent me a really nice message um, which was very thoughtful of him and 
had a big impact on me. Um, so, let me know if you have any questions about today's podcast. Um, either directed at me or Adam, and I'll try my best to answer them. Guys and girls, the my book, The Everyday Stoic: Simple Rules for a Good Life, it is out now. And a few people have been asking on Instagram, a bit is out. Uh, I'm going to keep saying it so everyone knows this out, but I'm very, very thankful. I'm extremely grateful for everyone that's uh, leaving reviews, um, sending me nice messages. Um, it's just very thoughtful um, to go out your way and send me a nice message. And it means a lot that people are reading this book and it's helping. Um, that's the most important thing because it's like, it's given me a lot of fuel to my fire to keep teaching this um, and to write more. When I'm getting the evidence in front of me that this really helps people, uh, I'm hearing so many stories about how much it's actually helping people. Um, and people I know as well is helping them. Uh, it just means a lot. It's given me a big fire under my belly to teach more, to study more, to experience more and learn to articulate that in a better way so you guys can understand it um, in a way that can actually help. I'm reading books on um, talking, communicating, because I'm not the best articulator, but that's something I'm learning. I'm really practicing so that I can get this, this thing, this. The reason the book's great is because I had so long to get it in the right order. I had help to get it in the right order for the grammar um, so that it really does make sense. It's articulated in a way that um, it's up here. Um, but it was a lot of work with these talks, you know, they're on the spot. Um, but that's why I'm putting a lot of practice into learning how to get this message across. You know, it's in my head. I need to get it out of there. Because the way I see it is if this thing, you know, I had a problem. Um, problem is X um, and solution was Y. So my problem was I was nervous, shy, anxious um, individual. And then solution, Y, stoicism came along and helped me. Um, if I can articulate problem X to the audience and I can articulate solution Y to the audience in the best way, in the way that I understood it, if it helped me, I know that whoever's listening I feel that some help. Let me know if um, these things have helped you because it just lights a bigger fire under my belly to keep teaching. It's um, good motivation and excitement to keep going. Anyway, quick shout out to the sponsor, Huel. Huel is a quick, affordable, nutritiously complete food with everything that your body needs. And if you have interest in any Huel products, then click the description below. I really do recommend Huel. Uh, I like all of their products i really like the instant meals because they're delicious and it's my kind of thing um, and i love the daily greens because who doesn't like tasty daily greens because most daily greens anyway um have a great day and thank you for listening then the jingle i need a jingle i don't have a jingle one day